Thank you very much. And can I just say what a pleasure it is uh, to be here. And as I introduce Sarah, Sarah, could you come out straight away? <laughs> and we're going to adopt a slightly more relaxed vibe as English people are known for. So we're going to both sit down. Not with a cup of tea. Not with a cup of tea, no. <laughs> So, um, I mean, I'm delighted to introduce Sarah to you. Um, she's the GMA's, the CMA's general counsel. And so as that, Sarah is a member of the executive team and she's a key advisor to the governing board. But I think it's important that we all understand that Sarah's executive responsibilities go beyond the CMA's legal team, no mere lawyer. She's also responsible for the CMA's policy team and for the CMA's international team that handles relationships with non-UK agencies and stakeholders. And to cap it all, Sarah also has responsibility, executive responsibility, for the establishment of the CMA's new Digital Markets Unit, which is going to implement the, and run the UK's new pioneering pro-competition regime for digital markets. So what does all of that mean for Sarah's role in merger review, which is, after all, why we're here today? Well, I think it's fair to say that having been general counsel since 2013, Sarah hasn't just been living through the recent important developments uh, in the CMA's policy thinking on merger review. She's actually been leading them. So I'm not sparing your blushes. Uh, and in all of this, Sarah brings to her general counsel role a proper understanding of corporations and deal makers' perspectives because before she joined the CMA, Sarah spent more than a decade at a leading UK law firm advising as a partner clients on multinational merger control. So, Sarah, it is wonderful to have you here today. Welcome. Thank you so much, Roger. That, that, that was quite a build up to it. I live up to my expectations, but I just need to start by saying, thank you for being here. It's really great to have you here. Thank you for being but I was just saying how you know how valuable it is for for me representing the CMA to be able to be here in person to have the opportunity to be able to connect with you picking up the point that was made in the um, previous introduction it's a great opportunity so please do catch me um, in the break or in the in the cocktail reception if, if you'd like to have a further conversation um, you know we recognize as the CMA the importance of, of your businesses recognizing many of you um, representing tech and life science businesses these are really really critical sectors, not just in the US, but also in the UK. And it's great really for us to be able to engage with you to explain a little bit more about our processes um, and to have this sort of two way dialogue about the impacts that the UK merge control can have on your businesses as well. So thank you. Great. Well, shall we kick off with the questions? And my job really is today is to ask the questions which may well be on your lips because I think it's fair to say that over the last couple of years, the CMA really has made its name known and its presence felt uh, right around the world, even for deals that one would think don't really touch the UK, but more about that in our first question. So Sarah, could you first take us through the international reach of UK merger control? So, as I said, we've seen deals in the last few years that where the UK, the CMA takes jurisdiction over a deal that is perceived really only to impact the US or where the target has any or hardly any activities in the UK or might have activities but no UK revenues. So, what's the basis for this and why has the CMA intervened in deals like this? Sure, thanks, Rod. Um, so I know that's a question that, that sort of comes across many of your desks, and I thought it would be useful just to kind of unpack a little bit how the jurisdictional tests work in the UK. So when we're looking at whether the CMA has jurisdiction to review a deal, there are basically two tests that can apply. Um, they may be more or less familiar, but let me run, run you through them very briefly. Um, so the first is a really quite a straightforward turnover test. It's very similar to the test that you might encounter in many jurisdictions when you're looking at merger control. And it's a question in the UK of whether the target company has UK turnover of at least 70 million pounds. So that's a pretty straightforward one. It's a, you know, it, it's clear it's either, it's either a tick or a cross against that one. 
The second test is the one that's perhaps a little bit less familiar to non-UK businesses and non-UK advisors, and that's what we call our share of supply test. Um, in essence, the test there is whether the merging companies together have a share of supply combined that amounts to at least 25% in terms of the UK share of supply. And you've got to have an increment to that as well. So you've got to have some addition to that share of supply. But perhaps the more sort of unusual feature of that is how broadly we can frame that share of supply test. So it doesn't equate to those of you who are perhaps more familiar with the substantive competition assessments. It's not just a sort of straight read across to how you might define an economic market when you're looking at a competition assessment. It's a much broader framing of what share of supply can constitute. Um, and that's something that's been confirmed in the UK by our UK courts and it's been sort of endorsed in our legislation and it's quite deliberate because it's kind of a gating principle it's basically saying is there a connection here with the uk that means that it's appropriate for the cma to review that deal doesn't mean that there's necessarily a problem doesn't mean that we will necessarily block it there's obviously a separate test in terms of whether there's a substantive competition issue but is it appropriate for us to review the deal and i thought i might just unpack a little bit some of the features of that share of supply test that can come as a little bit of a surprise for, to, to those of you who perhaps have less familiarity with it. So as I mentioned, the first point is that there's no sort of straight read across to the substantive assessment. The second point Rod mentioned is the fact that you don't have to have UK revenue to satisfy that share of supply test. And that's because, as I say, that the share of supply can be quite broadly framed and it can be referenced to a number of different activities. And what we're really looking at is, is there a UK activity, um, not necessarily a revenue generating UK activity. So a good example of that might be the recent um, review that the CMA undertook of the Facebook acquisition of Giphy. Now Giphy um, was very active in the UK, millions of UK consumers using Giphy to search for GIFs didn't have any revenue generating activity. So it wasn't generating turnover in the UK, but it was clearly active. And that's why the CMA felt that it was appropriate to take jurisdiction to look at that merger to see whether it gave rise to competitive concerns. We concluded that it did. But at the jurisdictional test, when we were looking at share of supply, what we looked at was search activities for GIFs in that case. So we looked at search activities through websites and through apps. And we concluded there that Meta and Giphy combined had a share of supply of around 50 to 60%. So pretty substantial activities both parties had in the UK, notwithstanding that Giphy didn't have any UK revenue. So that's that's one point which I think is, is perhaps sort of less familiar. Um, and it's a, it's a sort of example of a more general point, which is that the, the sort of reference point for share of supply test can be quite broadly scoped. So another example, maybe going back a little bit further, was our review of the Roche Spark acquisition. In that case, you're looking at sort of pharmaceutical um, pipeline. And in that situation, we weren't just looking at sort of active products on the market. We also went sort of upstream, looking at pipeline activity and looking at whether that pipeline activity was impacting in the UK. And that was how we framed that particular element of the share of supply test. So that I think is just a really important takeaway to when you're looking at your UK deals, don't assume that, that there has to be a sort of concrete um, UK presence. There doesn't have to be, um, for example, sort of UK location in terms of business activities. You don't have to have offices in the UK. You don't have to have employees in the UK. You don't have to generate revenue. But you do absolutely need to have um, an activity that's impacting in the UK. The other point that I thought was sort of worth drawing out is that um, in the share of supply test, we have this increment, we have this um, sort of additional element, so there has to be a combining, but that increment can be very, very small. And again, that perhaps takes parties by surprise. But again, it comes back to this gating point. So particularly where you've got one merging party who already has a very substantial presence in the UK, um, we think it's quite appropriate for us to take jurisdiction and look at a merger, even if the increment is potentially quite small. Um, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem when you get to the actual substantive competition assessment, but for the purposes of taking jurisdiction, there's sort of no minimum bar in terms of that incremental threshold. Um, and then I think sort of bringing that all together, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that we will take jurisdiction and review deals which are sort of say pure US to US deals where there's absolutely no impact on the UK. We wouldn't have the jurisdiction to do that. We wouldn't have the interest to do that because at the end of the day for the CMA, we're looking at the impact on UK markets and UK consumers. But I do think it's helpful for you to sort of think about in general terms, 
what are the merging parties UK activities and could you be hitting that jurisdictional threshold and then I think you know the other thing that's sort of worth bearing in mind on jurisdiction is as I said it doesn't sort of carry across automatically to the substantive um, framework but we also do have a kind of jurisdictional element to our substantive test. So even if we've decided we have the ability to review a deal, we then have to look and see, well, does that transaction actually give rise to, in our terms, a, a substantial lessening of competition in the UK? So you've got that UK framing again when you're doing that substantive assessment of the, of the competitive uh, effects as well. And then the final point, probably just worth a quick mention, um, I'll come back to this maybe later on, but again, those of you who are perhaps less familiar with the UK regime, is that it's quite unusual in being a voluntary notification regime. So you do have the option um, to choose to notify proactively if you want to, um, but it's equally um, up to the parties to decide not to notify a deal. Where deals aren't notified and we think we have jurisdiction, we have what we call a sort of call-in power, so we have, we have the ability to call a deal in and review that deal. Um, but again, we won't do that every single time the jurisdictional tests are met. We, we, we sort of operate quite proportionately in terms of exercising our jurisdiction. That's something perhaps we can pick up a little bit later on. Sure. And I think it's probably also worth just taking a quick forward look on this jurisdiction issue because the UK government last week announced some pretty important new reforms to the UK competition and consumer protection regimes. In particular, for our purposes, um, I'm interested in the changes that are going to include an additional jurisdiction test to catch in the CMA's net so that they can, you can review so-called killer acquisitions. Tell yeah. us about killer acquisitions, Kathleen. Thanks, Rod. So um, you're, you're right. The, the UK government um, issued a consultation response last week, in fact, which set out a, quite a broad set of um, proposed reforms across all sort of antitrust areas and, and indeed consumer enforcement areas as well. But on the merger side specifically, there is a proposal for an additional jurisdictional test, as Rod said, um, which is designed to capture sort of killer acquisitions, but also broader acquisitions going back to the, the previous discussion also on verticals for example so i mentioned before that our share of supply test at the moment requires an increment and that really bites particularly where there's some degree of sort of horizontal overlap between the parties um, the idea with the sort of killer acquisitions threshold is that you would have to have one party has really substantial presence already in the uk so the, the proposed threshold is that one of the parties has UK turnover of 350 million pounds and a UK share of supply of 33%. So you're looking at one of the parties having a very, very substantial UK presence already. And in that situation, the idea of this sort of killer acquisition threshold is that you don't need an you don't need a sort of additional incremental um, addition from the from the acquisition. We would have the ability then to look at potentially acquisitions of sort of nascent competitors who don't yet have a share of supply in the UK or indeed of parties who have a sort of vertical connection and don't necessarily have that sort of share of supply increment. So that, that's the thinking behind that. Obviously, um, we're a little way off that translating into legislation, so it's not yet enforced. I suspect it wouldn't be enforced for another year or so. Okay, thank you. So key takeaway from that, that set of answers, at your peril, do you assume that your US to US merger just can't be caught in the UK? I think that came through. Um, Turning to the next point, let's assume now that the CMA does have jurisdiction and is reviewing the case. How do you analyze a tech or life sciences merger's effect on innovation competition? And do you at the CMA, do you see your approach as more expansive than other leading authorities around the world? And in particular, what about uh, acquisitions by digital platforms? few easy questions for you. <laughs> so um, I will summarize that in a, in a few short words. Um, so I mean, obviously, this is this is highly topical at the moment, there's a lot of focus on innovation markets, competition innovation, how that plays out in merger control assessments. And we have had a number of cases in the UK where we've looked at these issues. You know, I wouldn't say that I think that the CMA is an outlier in our approach here. I think, you know, we are looking at these issues carefully and I can run us through a little bit of the framework for how we look at those issues. But the, the sort of focus for merger control on competition and innovation, I don't think is a particularly novel concept. If you look at, for example, both the European Commission and the authorities here in the US, um, existing, existing merger guidance, so before you get into the sort of consultation around potential reforms to those guidance, um, you know, they, they both feature competition and innovation as a relevant factor for merger control. So that's something I think that's quite well established. I'm sure you're, many of you will be aware of sort of 
economic discussion. There's a lot of discussion in economic literature as, as well about sort of looking at innovation and competition and how that is important for merger control. How does that play out for, for the UK? As I mentioned, we've had a number of cases in recent years where we've had a particular focus on what we sort of term dynamic competition. So looking at competition and innovation. And we've brought all of that sort of decisional practice together in a recent update to our own merger control guidelines. That's something that you can access on our website if you're interested to, to look at that. But that's, I think, quite a handy reference. It sort of takes you through the analytical framework that we apply in those mergers. And it's something that, you know, we're seeing very much across a number of different jurisdictions. Um, Noah Phillips mentioned earlier the, the consultation here in the US, which is looking at a number of factors, but includes whether additional um, measures are needed in relation to dynamic competition, innovation, and digital markets. Uh, in the UK, we actually issued a joint statement with our counterparts in Australia and Germany last year, again, with a particular focus on how authorities should go about looking at competition concerns in these dynamic digital markets uh, with a particular focus on, for example, themes around uncertainty and how that should sort of play through in the analytical framework. So, you know, I think we're pursuing something that is it probably has come into sharper focus, I would say, in the last couple of years because of the nature of the markets in which these issues are arising and because of the deals that we're seeing coming through. But I don't think that we're doing something that's sort of on, a, on, the, on the edges, really. I think it's very much in line with practice across a number of different agencies. And Rod, you asked about sort of digital markets in particular, and obviously we are seeing these issues particularly come to the fore in acquisitions involving digital players. You know, that's inherent in the nature of the market, inherent in the nature of their activities. And I think, you know, particular focus that we have there is where we do have one of the merging parties that has a substantial uh, market position. And that's where we're going to be sort of looking particularly at that impact on innovation if the acquisition goes through. Thank you. And I think, you know, particularly given where we are as a centre of global innovation here today, I think it'd be good to laser in on the CMA's distinction between potential and future competition on the one hand and current dynamic competition on the other because these, it does have a very practical significance for, the, uh, for your analysis of cases. And it's not always obvious to the naked eye what the difference is. So I'm thinking about a tech or a life sciences deal where I hear the acquirers say, no, this company that we're planning to buy, you know, it, it is an innovator, but it's not really active on the market yet. And it may not successfully enter, you know, if we don't buy it. So it may not enter absent the transaction. Does that sort of uncertainty mean that the CMA will be fine with the deal? Yeah, great, great question. And again, I think something that's of particular interest at the moment. And I think it is worth sort of unpacking a little bit what our thinking is. So I mentioned our own um, merger assessment guidelines, which sort of set out our framework there. When we're looking at deals that involve um, potential competitors in particular, so either potentially new entrants or companies that are looking to develop new products, new services, there are kind of two ways to look at that. So you may be looking at the sort of forward looking impact of entry. You know, will that competitor come into the marketplace in due course? And what's the loss of competition by taking them out of the market now in terms of the potential future impact that they may have? And there you're going to apply the sort of framework of looking at the prospect of entry, the impact of entry and how that plays out in the in the competitive market. But what we're also looking at in a number of these deals is the sort of the here and present competitive dynamic that we're seeing even before a company has necessarily come to market or a new product has come to market. And that's because you've got this sort of process of innovation that is generating a competitive dynamic just through that innovation process. And you can see, for example, with a, a sort of new competitor who's potentially in that sort of innovation design phase, there will be a competitive response that's happening in the marketplace now before they've even come to market, perhaps without them necessarily ever coming to market. And that's what we're looking at, where they're looking at this sort of potential loss of dynamic competition. What's the impact on the market if you take that competitor out now, will the acquiring company that's already in the market, for example, will they reduce their innovation efforts? Will the other market players reduce their innovation efforts as a consequence? So it's a more immediate focus on that competitive, innovative process. And you know, what does that mean in practice in terms of how we look at it? We're really focused on the market context. So what it doesn't mean is that we are going to come in and block any acquisition of an innovative competitor. That's absolutely not the case. And if you look at our 
um, reviews. There have been a number of cases where we've looked at these concerns, these theories of harm, and we've nonetheless cleared the acquisition right. ultimately. But it will turn on the market context. It will turn on factors such as the substantial presence of the acquiring company, for example, where we're going to be more concerned about that incremental loss of innovation. We'll be looking at third parties and the extent to which other players have also got innovative activities ongoing. We'll be looking quite concretely at the documentary evidence as well. So what do the company's documents tell us about their own views on prospects of entry, on dynamic competition, on innovation activities? Um, and what are the incentives for the different players in the market to innovate? So I, I suppose what I want to bring home is this is a focus for us. It's something that we think is really important. We do think merger control has a really important role to play here. But this doesn't mean that the CMA is sort of anti-tech or anti-innovation. You're absolutely the contrary. And I think that's for, for this audience in particular is a really important message. We, we see the fundamental value of innovation of, of the businesses that a number of you represent bringing both in the US, but also in the UK in terms of driving the economy, driving that economic growth, driving innovation. And what we're trying to do in a very focused way is ensure that competition is maintained in those markets, the markets support that innovative process. That may mean in some cases that we block a deal, but it doesn't mean in all cases that we will do that. And it, including, I would say, you know, a number of acquisitions um, by some of the, the, the major digital players um, that we have reviewed and cleared. Great. One last question. Um, coordination with agencies and reaching uh, consistent outcomes with fellow agencies uh, in the US, Europe and elsewhere. So how important is that for you? Or how unimportant is it for you? Is there a risk of divergence? And what's the CMA's view on those divergence risks, given in particular the impact that that can have on deal certainty, particularly for worldwide deals? So put more concretely, how's your relationship with the European Commission? And how does that relationship compare with your relationship with other leading authorities, such as the uh, FTC and DOJ? So, in a nutshell, um, <laughs> I mean, maybe taking it in reverse order, I would say, you know, the relationships are really good, actually. You know, we've, we have a long track record, even before the sort of uptick in cases that the CMA is reviewing now, obviously post-Brexit. Um, but we've got a long track record of cooperation, both with the US agencies, um, with the Commission, the European Commission, and many others. Um, and I think, you know, that has only that has only improved and increased in the last in the last few months as we've seen that sort of uptick in our own activity. I think we recognize the value both for agencies and for businesses in trying to achieve that coordination. We work really, really closely with um, other agencies. And we also really encourage businesses to engage with us to help us to understand you know, your timing and your processes, what you're trying to achieve in terms of aligning different processes. And you know, the more that you can engage with us and have that dialogue with us, the more helpful it is, I think, mutually both for us um, and for you. We've, we've had a number of cases uh, maybe a couple of examples recently, NVIDIA Arms, a good example, um, Cargatec um, Cone Cranes, um, where we've, we've worked really, really closely with the agencies. I would say it doesn't always mean that the outcome is aligned. Um, in the vast majority of cases, I would say that the agencies are applying, you know, broadly speaking, the same analytical framework. We'll be trying to align where we can on processes and timing. In some cases, there will be differences in local market conditions, and in some cases, there may be some differences in timing. But I would say that's sort of the exception rather than the norm that you end up with a divergent outcome. For the most part, it's very much about alignment and cooperation and really encouraging that dialogue with the businesses as well so that we can try to achieve that as efficiently as possible. Thank you. That's a great answer and also exquisitely timed because our little clock is telling us that we're now counting down to zero seconds. So I think that's it. For, um, for this session.